May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So we are uh, we're starting a series on Ephesians. Our second reading today, the, the um, epistle reading, was from Ephesians. It'll be from Ephesians. We'll work our way through that letter through the end of August. And so Gavin and I will be preaching through that um, over these next seven weeks, I think it works out to. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, I wasn't going to preach on the gospel. I'm not going to preach on the gospel. But I think in our gospel, we have a picture of what it looks like when we start to see our opponent as an enemy. And it ends up with someone's head on a platter, dead. I think our gospel can preach uh, to our moment. Because our gospel imagines a banquet in which the goal of the banquet is power and prestige instead of the banquet of the kingdom where God talks to us about what that looks like. So that's the gospel. We'll set that aside because I do want to get into Ephesians. Ephesians is an interesting book. This is normally, Gavin, is he's been at Camp Allen um, all week, which is our diocesan summer camp, so he's been stuck with uh, teenagers in the heat and humidity. And so please pray for him. Uh, maybe he'll survive. I haven't heard from him. I don't know what. Maybe it's like Lord of the Flies down there. Um, but this is, this is the point uh, where, if you know, Gavin and I have done some team teaching, where it's been like when we've entered into a new liturgical season, like Lent, or we entered into an idea like Pentecost. He and I have had a conversation where it's less like a sermon and, and just more like we're going to unpack something. I'm going to try to do that by myself today. Uh, in the form of a sermon, but we're going to look at Ephesians. I'm setting the stage for what we're going to talk about over the next seven weeks. So Ephesians um, is the name of this letter, and the next slide shows where I think, oh no, this is me. This is where I was last week. I got to do my best uh, megachurch pastor impersonation, and I preached down the street at the well. It's a non-denominational church that's pastored by my friend Trey Grant on Main Street in Keller, and um, my watch has this thing where if it gets too loud, it gives me an alert. Uh, Bob and the choir up there have never set off my watch. Their band did last week, so it was, it was quite a change of pace. Uh, but they were uh, lovely. It was great to be with them and the, the full breadth and expanse of what we as the people of God can look like. And they pray for us. We pray for them, right? We pray for all the churches in this area. If you'll notice here in a minute, in our prayers of the people. We pray for other Episcopal churches in our diocese. We also pray for other churches in our city. And it's non-denominational churches, it's Baptist churches, it's church, it's all of them, uh, because we're all one body of Christ. Uh, I just wanted to show you all what I look like when I don't wear these robes. So here we go. Here's Ephesus. It's up there. Ephesus is in Turkey, uh, modern-day Turkey, Asia Minor. And um, Ephesus, the church itself, uh, Paul spent about three years there. He didn't found it, but he spent a long time there. And so um, it was an early seed of Christianity in that region. It was one of the main um, churches there. But here's the trick. This letter probably wasn't actually written to that church in Ephesus. So there's this thing called biblical criticism, which if you've been to our Sunday morning Bible study, we've talked about this. The Bible wasn't handed to someone 2,000 years ago. It's like, here's the whole book. It's completely intact. You can sell it and make money off of it. You can do all... No, that's not how we got the Bible, right? The Bible was in bits and pieces called fragments, and really smart people try to put them together. A lot of the Bible, we don't actually have whole books together. We piece together things. And so of these fragments, the majority of the fragments of the book that we call the letter to the Ephesians don't mention Ephesians, right? And and what we read, the NRSV, it opens up before where we picked up today, It says, to the saints who are in Ephesus. It maybe actually just said to the saints. And so first off, that that doesn't change anything about the book, but it just helps us understand that this was written maybe not to a church, but maybe to the church, if that makes sense. So many of Paul's letters were written uh, to churches experiencing specific problems. If you remember in one letter, he talks about Uh, like people who just won't keep quiet in church. And he's like, y'all need to be quiet for a little bit. Or in another, he talks about the people who cut in line at the potluck. Seriously, look it up. It's in the book. 
and there's people who don't get any. So he's writing to people, and he's, he calls out names. So be careful. There's precedence for me calling people out if y'all are causing problems. That happens in some of the letters. That doesn't happen in Ephesians. We don't get specific problems for specific communities. So the idea is most biblical scholars probably believe, or believe that probably this letter was written to the churches of Asia Minor. It's what's called a circular letter. It was meant to be read and then sent around. All of Paul's letters ended up being that. They passed them around because they were awesome. This one was maybe intended to be that. It's a letter that gives us advice on how to, to operate as a community. It's a letter that reminds us of who we are as followers of Jesus. Another thing to note, the next slide you'll see, they keep unearthing things. This is in Ephesus. I was privileged to go there when I was in seminary. They keep unearthing things there. And uh, Christine Geringer, who's normally at the 830 service, she was just there a couple of weeks ago. And um, it's an active archaeological site. They keep finding things. They keep finding all of this. That's another thing that we keep doing with Scripture, is we don't just have the book and we're like, that settles it. For a long time, uh, people thought Paul absolutely wrote this letter. But we actually use research methods. We actually use... um, study, and the grammar of this letter is not like any of the other letters. The words in this letter are not like any of the other letters. And so as we continue to wrestle with Scripture, both spiritually, but also historically and academically, we maybe understand that this was someone from the school of thought of Paul. And so that doesn't change anything about it. It's still part of the Bible. We're not kicking it out, right? It's still useful for teaching and preaching, all the things that we say about Scripture. But it helps us understand that these are, these are living documents that weren't just handed to us complete. We as the church are the ones that get to decide about this. And so maybe this is from the school of Paul. I'm going to talk about Paul. And so now you're going to say, oh, you're saying Paul did it. No, that just makes it shorthand. It makes it easy. I'm just trying to set the stage, some history about this book. So we have this Letter of Paul to the Ephesians, none of which I just said makes sense if you listen to the first part of my sermon. But this letter to the Ephesians, and it is um, it's a summary of Paul's, the school of Paul's theology. And it breaks down into two segments, mainly. The first three chapters, it's a reminder of who we are. It's a reminder of what God has done for us. It's a reminder of what God says about us. It's a reminder of who we as followers of Jesus are. Three chapters, which we'll get to the first chapter here in a minute. It sets us up. And then in chapter 4, Paul says, therefore, and that's the hinge for the whole book. We've been told who we are. And then in chapter 4, Paul says, therefore, And chapters 4, 5, and 6 tell you, so what? We know who we are. The rest of the letter tells us what we do about it, how we behave as Christians. Some of y'all might, I had Ephesians 5 read at my wedding. Maybe y'all did too. There's things that tell children how to behave, how parents how to behave, how husbands and wives behave, how workers and employers behave, how the community of faith and the family of believers behave. Because once we know who we are, we have a better idea of what God calls us to do. And so we're going to break that down. The lectionary over these next seven weeks, we'll spend these next three weeks in those first chapters remembering who we are. We'll spend a week on that hinge, and then we'll spend a couple weeks about now what do we do about it. The main verse for me in the whole book I think is the next slide up here. Yeah, Ephesians 2.10. This is, if there's a thesis, if there's a summary statement of Ephesians, for my money, it's this. For we are what Christ has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so we may walk in them. For we are what he has made us. That's these first three chapters. We remember who God made us to be how God loves us, what God has done for us. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we may walk in them. 
that so we may walk in them. That's the second half of the letter that we'll get to in a couple of weeks. But first, we need to talk about Ephesians 1, 3 through 14. This, we break it down. We put periods and commas here to make it easier for us to read. In the original Greek, what we read today, up here, one sentence. Right? It's one of the reasons we don't think Paul wrote it. Paul, this is the longest sentence Paul would have wrote by like a magnitude. It's one of the longest sentences in all of Scripture. And so there's some scholars that believe it's maybe not a sentence, but it's a lyric. That maybe it was used devotionally or liturgically as a way for the community to remember. Not just as something written down for us to study and examine and parse and all of that, but for us to embody as who we are. And the whole thing starts off talking about blessing. And so that's what we're going to focus on today. Blessed. What does it mean to be blessed? So I got an email. I'm not calling anybody out. I know I just threatened to do that. This was actually a good email. Y'all email me questions sometimes, and uh, a lot of times I wait for Gavin to respond because he's smarter than me and he'll answer them. But this one was just sent to me, and so I was, uh, I was left out there. And so um, Bennett, who normally comes to 8.30, he asked me this question. He said, I'm struggling with Eucharistic prayer C. So if you're new around here, we have different prayers we say at the table. Those are called Eucharistic prayers. And in prayer C, there's this phrase that we all say together. And we say, we praise you, we bless you, we give thanks to you, and we pray to you, Lord our God. And Bennett was like, I'm on board with I can praise God. I'm on board with I can thank God. I'm on board with I can pray to God. But he asked, how can I bless God? That's a really good question. And so I um, actually had to look at the Greek, which I, don't, I try not to do as much as possible. But if you look at the Greek, this word bless, that sets the stage for all that we're going to talk about today. That first word, which I can't read, and so I had to write it in English, eulogetos, it's eulogy. The same word for blessing is where we get eulogy. And so when we bless God, we're not, it's not like we're giving God gifts. It's not like we're giving, although we do, the way we bless God in this understanding of the Greek is that we say good things. It's our praise. It's our thanksgiving. It's speaking well of. It's the way we talk about. That is the sense of blessing that I think Paul's getting at in this letter today, when he says, blessed be God, Paul's saying all of that. I also think it gets into a way we bless God is how we talk about God's people. The words that we use when we talk about all that God has created. Because when God looked at everything God created, God said it was all good. A couple thousand years later, we sometimes use different words to describe other people. But that's maybe another sermon for another day. And so Paul goes in on this letter. And this is is Paul quoting maybe a lyric or coming up with a lyric that was then used by the church. And he's using this to set the stage. He's saying, in essence, everything I'm about to tell you is about who God says that you are and who we know ourselves to be. And he layers it and layers it and layers it. And he uses a series of verbs. And I put the verbs up here so you can look at them. I think we did, yeah. And so blessed, we started. Paul starts this letter. He says, God has blessed us. God has spoken highly of us. God has given us gifts. God has blessed us. And Paul builds on that. All of these build on each other. And I, I dare you. Look at the reading. I actually dare you, read the whole letter of Ephesians. Maybe bring your Bible to church for the next six weeks. Get make people nervous out there. <laughs> Circle stuff, highlight stuff, figure out. These things that we read week to week, they're not stimpets. We're not just pulling pull quotes out. 
what we talk about in church, it builds on itself. And what we talk about today in Ephesians will impact how we understand what we read next week. And so in our reading today, first, God has blessed us. God's not just blessed us, God has chosen us before the foundations of the world. This is what Paul says. Before we knew what we would become, before we knew what good things in our life we would do, before we knew the ways that we would screw up, before we knew anything about anything, God knew. And God chose us. And Paul says it goes even further. Not only have we been chosen, not only have we been picked for the team, not only does God say, yeah, you, we've been chosen for adoption. Paul goes on to say, we have been destined for adoption as his children. Because we're not just chosen as people God knows. We're not just chosen as people that God will look at and give the head nod. We're chosen as God's sons and daughters and children. We're chosen. Paul goes on, we're not just chosen, but like any parent would, we have had gifts bestowed upon us, given to us. Paul says it's God's grace bestowed upon us. But not just bestowed. It's not like just one time giving. It's not just like, here, you can have the leftovers. It's not just like, no. Paul builds on it even further and says, God's gifts have been lavished upon us. Lavished is one of Paul's favorite words. It's a good word. It's not just, because sometimes we say we've received the gift. That's, okay. I can receive a lot of things. I receive criticism very well. I receive criticism, kind of. But, like, we receive these things. But, like, God's not just, like, handing out things. God's lavishing, overflowing. God can't help but pour out upon us. And so that's who we know ourselves to be in relation to God. The first of these verbs up here that Paul uses in this letter remind us that God has blessed us. God has chosen us. God has adopted us. God has given us gifts. God has lavished those gifts upon us. So we know who we are, and we know what God has done for us. But then Paul hints at what's coming next. Remember, this letter isn't just about who we are and what God has done for us. That's half the letter. And that's only half of what Paul gets to in his introduction today. Because when we've been blessed, when we've been chosen, when we've been adopted, when gifts have been bestowed upon us, when things have been lavished upon us, God makes known what we're to do with that. And so the next verb God uses to build on this is that he has made known his plans. Some of you might be thinking, I don't actually know God's plan for my life. And if so, you're in good company because I'm still figuring it out. But that's not what Paul's getting at here. Paul's not getting at like, us understanding what we specifically are supposed to do. What Paul's saying is he has made known God's plan. Because God didn't keep this a secret. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus showed what God's plan is. It's the redemption of all things. It's resurrection. It's healing. It's wholeness. It's restoration. It's life. God has made known to us what God's plan is. And Paul goes on, in case we need a reminder. He says he's made known this plan, and this plan is that we will all be gathered up. All things in heaven and earth. All things. Not good things. Not right things. 
not Episcopal things. All things will be gathered up. And Paul reminds us that we have a role in this. Because once we know who we are, once we know what God has done for us, once we remember what God's plan is, we then figure out how we participate in this work. And we talk about that a lot in here, ways we participate in God's mission. Because all these things that God has done for us, we're called to do for our neighbors. We're called to do for our enemies. We're called to do for the world. We can bless others. We can choose to be with others. We can remember that we're all adopted and we're all family with others. We can serve others and bestow upon them and help them receive and remember the gift of God's grace. We can do all of these things because we know we are a part of God's plan to gather up all things. And so as we walk through this letter to the Ephesians over the next several weeks, we'll hear again and again what God has done for us, and we'll be reminded again and again of what God expects for us. And so as we leave this place today, we know we've been blessed. We know we've been chosen. We know we've been adopted. And we know God has a plan to gather up all things. And we also know that we have a part to play in that. Amen.